It's no jerk. Everyone ready? Okay. Right. So call the meeting to order and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Uh, we'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, previous meeting. Is there such a motion? Is there a second? second? On the question. It's been moved and seconded that the minutes be approved and the reading of them waived. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes carry. Um, at this point, uh, we'll give the uh, public an opportunity to address the Board of Managers on the agenda items only. Anyone wish to address the board? Okay. There being none, we'll uh, seek the report of the Juvenile Detention Center and request Mary Stein to provide the same. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. At the time the report was um, completed there were seven juveniles at the center currently there's five June admissions 14 year to date 74 two females which remain the same um, days of service 118 for male three for female um, we still have one juvenile um, down at Northampton uh, overtime for the month was down significantly from last year $3,409.78 116 hours the breakdowns on the back staffing report stays the same um, the right center and Bayadas contracts were approved for month-to-month -month status now um, and on August 2nd all the juvenile detention staff will participate in a mental health first aid training at the center NAMI provides that training it is a free training and all the overtime that is accrued will be covered by them and that concludes my report can I ask why we would have a uh, juvenile in Northampton County? He committed a crime against one of my officers. Oh, so, all right, to avoid the conflict of yeah. interest. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, sir. And uh, also, uh, looking at the hours of comparison uh, for 2017, 2016, um, they uh, appear to be on uh, a similar track um, or no, I'm sorry. L looking at it, uh, the year-to-date totals uh, being halfway through the year, we'd be considerably less. Yes. Okay. Our our count our juveniles have been very low, so it didn't require me to staff so much. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyone else have any questions for the director? <coughs> there being none, we'll entertain a motion to accept the uh, report as submitted. Is there such a motion? Is there been moved and seconded on the question? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Public wish to address the uh, members of the Board of Managers on uh, any matters whatsoever. Okay. Are there any other business for any of the members? There being none, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn the Board of Managers. Is there such a motion? Second. Moved and seconded on the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> the Board of Managers meeting is adjourned. Now calling to order the meeting of the Prison Board, and we will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting uh, without being read and as submitted. Is there such a motion? Moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded on the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes carry. The minutes are approved as submitted. And uh, at this time, members of the uh, public who might wish to address the board on agenda items only, please come forward. None at this point. Uh, we will now entertain a motion uh, subject to the approval by the controller's office to approve all current payables for the Community Correction Center, the Juvenile Detention Center, 
and the prison. They have been attached or provided to the members in advance. Is there such a motion to approve the payables? So moved. Second. And moved and seconded on the question. They have all been reviewed and approved and audited. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes carry. At this point, we will uh, request the controller's report. Um, and uh, Mr. DeBilio's deputy will provide the same. Thank you. <clears throat> the controller's office reviewed the prison inmate and canteen account reconciliations, <clears throat> excuse me, which were prepared by the prison business office for the month of June 2017 and found no discrepancies between the reconciliations and the bank statements. The balance in the inmate account was $369,309.60 as of June 30th, 2017. The balance in the canteen checking account was $433,009.71 as of June 30th, 2017. In addition, as of June 30th, the canteen account owned two certificates of deposit value, valued at $15,000 and $131,790.29, totaling $146,790.29. That completes our report. Any questions uh, for <coughs> the controller's office regarding the report? There being none, we'll entertain a motion to approve the controller's report <coughs> as submitted. Is there such a motion? It's been moved and second, moved and seconded on the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes carry. Uh, at this time, we'll request the Community Correction Center report and uh, Mr. Jeffers. Good afternoon, Board. Good afternoon. Community Corrections Programs Report for June 2017, Item 1, Program Totals. Male work release had 53 participants, female work release had four. Adult house arrest had 140. Juvenile house arrest had, had, had 19 participants. Item two, our program's revenues for the month of June totaled $67,705.68. Item three, our program's expenses totaled $83,309.55. Item four, our program completions work release had 10. House arrest had 35. Our program violations work release had seven. House arrest had 15. Our program's warrants, seven for work release, two for house arrest. And our budget report in item number seven is overtime is at 52% for the year. Expenses are at 46% for the year and revenue is at 54% over the year. There's an asterisk on the expenses and the only reason that is, is actually if you look at our budget report, it'll show that we're at 51% for the year. However, we ended up taking $52,000 out of our budget to pay for the uh, apartments for the, uh, the female work release and that was reimbursed to us. It just doesn't show on a percentage line. That concludes my report. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Jeffers? Um, Mr. Jeffers, um, there had been a discussion regarding uh, or maybe that, okay, we have that uh, later on here, uh, the expansion of the women's work release program. Yes, there's uh, there's something on the agenda today to uh, discuss and either approve or disapprove to expand the women's work release. And uh, when that agenda item comes up, if there's right. any questions, I'll <coughs> we'll call you explain back further. Work. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. All those in favor of accepting the uh, report of the Community Correction Center as submitted, in the, uh, please indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The ayes carry. Uh, at this point, we'll request the warden's report. <coughs> Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon, Mr. Betty. Uh, the average daily in-house population for the month of June was 896 inmates. Uh, regarding overtime report, the out-of-county board report, and the community service program participation report, they were all attached. Our staffing update is as follows. Um, our current correctional officer numbers break down to 171 uniform staff on shift, one out on workers' comp, one on continuous FMLA, 22 have uh, intermittent FMLA, uh, four other, and there are presently three vacancies. Budget as of uh, June 30th, revenue is at 39% and expenses are at 47%. 
Juvenile inmates currently we're housing four juveniles, two males and two females. Inmates at or past their minimum date, it, the number is 39, 13 have uh, no home plan, six are presently in community service and or being transferred to work release. Um, three have had their parole denied due to unacceptable home plans. 17 have a home plan submitted and they're awaiting parole and six have been remanded for the balance of their sentence. Extraordinary occurrence reports, there were two extraordinary occurrences since the last prison board meeting. On uh, June 29th, the county inmate was placed into the restraint chair for her own safety after resisting officers during a move to restrictive housing. And on July 6th, the CERT team was activated due to a disturbance in DA unit. Inmates were refusing to lock in after being ordered to do so. The incident was de-escalated prior to sending the CERT team in into the housing unit. Priya, there were four allegations of uh, Priya violations since our last meeting. Two were deemed unsubstantiated. One was founded and one is still under investigation. Commissary RFP, we've received three proposals from one from Oasis, one from Aramark, and one from Keefe. And uh, we conducted an initial evaluation of the proposals. We're in the process of contacting the three companies for some clarifications and we'll reconvene to evaluate the responses to our request for clarifications. And uh, food service RFP and medical services RFPs, um, we, conti we continue to develop RFPs for both the food service and the medical services, and both will be advertised in the near future. Um, before saying this concludes my report, I would just ask that if the board would consider a, an executive session at some part uh, point during this meeting, I would like to discuss a personnel issue. All right, thank you, Warden. Um, I have one or two questions, please. Um, with regard to the inmates past their, uh, their minimum and the no home plan. Um, and then I note, you know, there were 13 of those and uh, three denied due to an unacceptable home plan. But when you say no home plan whatsoever, are there steps in place to help develop a home plan? Uh, has notification been provided to the court? Um, I, I don't know about the notification to the court, but I can certainly look into that when I get back. Regarding steps that are in place, those six that I mentioned right after it, those are the steps. The first thing we'll do is we'll look at getting them worked into the work release program so that they can develop the home plan. Right. Um, sometimes, frankly, uh, the person doesn't meet the qualifications for participation in work release. It may be based on charges. It may be that that individual was in work release and was sent back. Uh, Maybe he walked away from work. Or at least there's a lot of variables that are involved. I, I, I understand when there are denials for that, um, but we we'll just uh, hopefully offer encouragement that uh, where someone doesn't have a home plan, that we are uh, acceptable uh, or inclined to grant placement in the work release program so someone can develop a home plan rather than run up the expenses and uh, be there past their minimum. Right, and, and I do have a, a re-entry coordinator who will talk with um, Mr. Jeffers from Work Release about those individuals. Right, okay. Um, but I can certainly look into those other seven individuals that are, seem to be in a limbo state right now. And when there's uh, determined to be a uh, founded uh, violation for PREA, what's the next step? That information then gets submitted to the district attorney's office not that every single time you, ha you have a founded issue that it's a, a crime, uh, but the practice is that that information gets submitted to district attorneys for, for, for Mr. Scanlon's review and determination if, if there's any criminal proceedings that need to take place. And are any notifications provided to any agencies, uh, you know, since it is a, would be a, a violation of uh, the PREA rules that, uh, that we must enforce? I, I wish I could say exactly which one it is. I know that there's a national agency that's related to Priya, and I know that Mari Finland, who's our Priya supervisor, would make a report to them as well. She does an annual report to well, them. Looking into that and giving us more oh, detail. Oh, definitely. All right. Yep. Okay. Anyone else have any questions for the warden? Um, on the uh, numbers for the uh, Priya Pastorman date. I've seen these numbers dramatically decrease, and I just wanted to commend you and ask, is this part of the uh, committee that Chairman had uh, initiated 
to kind of lower those numbers and, and is this the effect of Yes, this, this is an issue that Tom Early had discovered and that we continue to work on, yes. Congratulations, and congratulations to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and uh, anyone else, any questions for the ward? We'll uh, address that uh, personnel issue when we've concluded the other matters, okay. all right? All right, thank you, warden. Um, all right, what else we got here? Okay, um, under new business, um, there were is an issue uh, that uh, was brought to my attention uh, within the last week, and I'd like to recall Mr. Jeffers to address that. This is an issue regarding work release. At the uh, current time, we uh, have the Women's Work Relief Center. Uh, that was established when this board approved the uh, return of the men's work release to downtown. And uh, this board uh, addressed and approved uh, a long overdue uh, fulfillment of a need for a women's work release center. Uh, we started that on a trial basis about a year ago, Mr. Jones. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was June 20th when it started. Okay, um, and it has worked well. And uh, there is some concern uh, that was raised and discussed with the president judge as well. Uh, that perhaps it should be expanded. Uh, currently, uh, our capacity in the Women's Work Relief Center is uh, four. Four. Right? And the capacity in the Men's Work Relief Center is 45? 44. 44. Um, and that is representative of the population of the prison, which uh, is roughly uh, the female population is roughly 10% of the male population, is it? Roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it switches every day, as, okay. as Mr. Betty could tell you, but we're, we're, we're within a 1% or 2% range of that also. If we brought this up to two more, we would be in line with the prison's population percentage. You want to explain your proposal, please? Well, the proposal is, is that we would take another apartment um, and put two more females, which we do have a backlog on, and that's part of the reason the president the judge called me over. Uh, we have been full of capacity for the past several months. Um, it is only four beds, and so I'm saying full capacity is, is, is a broad term, but we have had full capacity for the past several months, and we have several girls waiting to get out of prison. And the only reason they're still in prison is because they cannot either afford a place to stay or cannot uh, find a job for a place to stay. Um, and or, or cannot get a home plan within their families or friends or something like that. So we feel as though that, that not only will this bring us up percentage-wise, but it's also a good thing for everyone in general, especially the prison, We're getting more females out of the prison that coincide with the same amount of men that are coming out of the prison at the same time. Uh, the, the proposal that we have, if everyone remembers, that we were paying uh, $1,100 a month per apartment uh, we ended up signing a two-year lease with the individuals, uh, P&D Enterprises, and we submitted that amount of money to uh, the law enforcement grant with the state through Senator Blake's office, which we were granted, and uh, we ended up paying that through 2019, May 31st, 2019. This would be an additional apartment that is not covered by that grant, and I'm asking the board today if we can cover it out of the canteen fund. Um, it would start on August 1st, 2017, and end on May 31st, 2018. Um, so it's $11,000. And what this does is it gives us maybe some more time to file for some more grant money uh, within the next year or, or come up with another solution. Or if the numbers start dwindling towards the end of this term, do we need the, the third apartment or not is what it comes down to. And uh, I, I would point out that uh, the funding for the return of the uh, male work release center uh, was approved by this board uh, through the uh, use of canteen fund monies. That is also how we started up the female uh, work release program. And uh, as we heard from the controller earlier today, uh, we have the capacity to absorb that expense. Uh, and um, speaking on the topic, I, I would think that it is fair and appropriate. Um, First of all, the work release program does allow that flexibility for people who have reached their minimum uh, and can't develop a home plan. This gives them a, a place to go and do it. It is also a positive revenue source for the county that money comes in. 
but the uh, uh, another important point is the fact that uh, it would be uh, more reflective of the actual ratio uh, of the prison population uh, that the expansion of the numbers to permit more females would be in line with uh, the percentage of our population that is female. Um, anyone else have any questions or thoughts on the topic? Canteen fund would cover this right it would, Yes, it would. We, we, I do not have the 11000 for in our budget. And, and quite honestly, it, it is going to get them out of the prison. It's, it's their funds, too. So, uh, At this point, um, the chair will entertain a motion to expand uh, the Women's Work Relief Center by contracting for uh, four more apartments um, with the... One, one more. Sorry, sir. Go ahead. Sorry, sir. It's one more apartment, two more beds. And, uh, one more apartment. One more apartment, two more beds, yes. Okay. It will be six total with everything that we have. Um, all right. There, we have two apartments yes, now. Yes, sir. Each one having two. We're going to add one more. Apartment. Yes, sir. Make it six. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Um, so the the chair will entertain a motion to expand the program by uh, contracting for another apartment on the same terms from the same provider uh, as has been successfully done in the uh, for the past year now. Is there such a motion? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded on the question. Okay. There being no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes carry. Thank, Thank you. you, Board. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Okay. All right. Um, at this point, um, we'll uh, grant the public an opportunity to address the Board on any issues. Mr. Wallace. Good afternoon, members of the board. Bob Bolas, Scranton. There are a couple issues uh, that I would like to discuss. One, at the uh, prior commissioners meeting, I uh, presented the commissioners and the people uh, what's going on August 5th at the Marine Corps League. What this is here is a picture of Iwo Jima when the flag was being raised on Mount Suribachi. It's a whole story done by the Japanese uh, about everything that Sergeant Ganas did. And on the back is not only the story about what he did, but my participation that's been recognized worldwide in what I've been doing. And it references my hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania. The flag was flown over on the uh, 70th anniversary of Iwo Jima, of the flag raising. I was there and I did purchase the flag at an auction. The flag will now be presented to the uh, Marine Corps League in honor of all members of the service, not just the Marines, but every one of us, those that were in the Army and so on and so forth. The ceremony will be two o'clock at the Marine Corps League on East Mountain. Uh, dinner will follow after that. Uh, the flag then will stay at the Marine Corps League. It's inscribed uh, about who he was, what he did, and it has on there, it's donated by Bob Bolas that uh, we're giving it here to do. What people don't seem to realize, and it disturbs me very much when I travel around the country, as I did in this last campaign, and see people disrespect the flag. Sergeant Ganost, and this is a camera he was using, that's one of the old antiques of the world. He gave us that iconic symbol we stand and salute every day we pledge to. He gave us that iconic symbol every time we see a documentary showing the flag being raised. That's Sergeant Ganost. He's still entombed in a cave on Hill 362 Abel. I've been there three times. I'll be going back the fourth time. I've been given permission now by the Emperor and the Prime Minister of Japan to join the Japanese in conducting the search for our people as well as their own people. And uh, I will be going back over there very shortly to finish my mission and bring them home. We do recover his remains. They will be entombed under the monument in D.C. An honor that's uh, well-deserving and well-fitting. 
And I couldn't be prouder not only to represent what I'm doing with him, but represent the city of Scranton. Issues I brought up in the past, and excuse me, but Sheriff and everybody uh, with the word and all, this is also open to our COs and members of the Sheriff's Department and law enforcement that have served or prior service. It's open to the public. So I want everybody to know that. Come out and honor the individual who gave us that iconic symbol and honor our flag the way it should be honored. When I came here, uh, I had been an inmate in the jail and I went through a lot of stuff there myself with personal injuries and medical issues. I've raised more than once the question about getting a pillow there. We're spending millions and millions here, millions there. Yet you had an individual, he came in and he had a hormone issue. Right away now everybody's jumping through the hoops to see that he gets this, gets that. I was on a heart medication called Plavix. Zologo, the head of correctional care, took me off it and refused to give it back to me, putting my life in jeopardy. When I left the jail, I wound up going through extensive catheterization and everything else to try and undo the damage created that he created for me. Sleeping in there without a pillow or trying to make a pillow, no matter what it is, is very inconvenient. You don't get a night's sleep. It's bad enough you're sleeping on a two-inch mattress. I requested that some of us older people or whoever could get skin milk to drink. It's not a big thing, but we couldn't get it. And I think the time has come. If we could patronize this individual with his issues and jump through the hoops, I'm sure if he requested a pillow today, he'd get one. And he wouldn't have to go to the commissary and buy. As we know, you, they're available at the commissary, but people don't have the money to buy. You're paying your phone service. You're buying your little trinkets. Inmates can't do it. And on top of that, as I was on Social Security, the government took my Social Security checks. That was my money I earned through a lifetime that they took and used it for whatever it is that it never comes back. So for those six months, I lost what I earned in a lifetime. Had I had mortgages and had to pay responsibilities, I couldn't do it and I would lose because the government elected to take my money. So there are a lot of things that face an inmate in a prison that people on the outside don't know and quite frankly I don't think a lot of them really give a damn one way or the other other than those that are concerned as we have here today. I've been involved with uh, a program on PTSD. I brought it up with the commissioners earlier and now we're gonna move forward setting up a meeting with a Dr. George Lindfeld from Florida who's a clinical psychologist that wrote the book Brain on Fire. PTSD affects everybody in every circumstance. It's not just those in the military, but people in our daily lives, whether you're in prison or you have a home issue or whatever it may be. And we're looking at getting that done here through a funding. And I will be dealing with the commissioners, thankfully, uh, we're moving forward. Because the way I believe that a fire starts with a spark, and the spark's gonna start here right in Scranton, Lackawanna County, that's gonna reach around the world because we're gonna be the leaders in PTSD recovery for people that are there. And we're a group of people in this town that know how to proceed, and we're a group of people in this community that know how to make things happen. And I couldn't be prouder to be in this room today with the individuals here knowing that we have the support and the open-mindedness to go forward. So I applaud everybody here that hopefully we're gonna make this happen. And if we save one life, we've done one hell of a job. So I will be bringing Dr. Lynn filled up. I'm paying his, all his expenses to bring him here because this is one of the most important missions that I could think of regarding human nature. And I would ask again that uh, we pay attention to getting pillows at the jail. I hate to harp on it and harp on it. I had a broken neck and I had to sleep bundled up underwear, anything I could to try and rest my head. And I went through a living hell. When I left the jail, I was injected in my neck, my both shoulders, and my back from the injuries I had prior to going in there. And Zalogo, with correctional care, refused to see that I had cardiac care 
or, or at the PD care, and he's not an expert in any one of those fields. And I would just ask the board, if his contract comes up again, ignore him. He didn't do the job regarding the people. He did it regarding filling his pocket with money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, we appreciate your longstanding interest in these uh, uh, and important I issues and, uh, and bring them to our attention. Uh, the warden, I'm sure, will look at the request that he can yeah. handle and uh, we'll give due consideration. Well, I appreciate you listening thank to you. me, Judge. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else who wish to address? Yes, I'd like to speak because uh, I'm in the chair and I, I wish for a way to. Uh, how do we do this? I know it's about uh, here it is. Hi, it's, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, uh, what's your hi. name, please? Hi, my name is Pinky Stanceski, and I was here last month, and uh, I respectfully disagree with Bob Bolas. He obviously hates transgender people, and I urge you to fire Dr. Zagoda, Zaloga, if I spell his name right, and prohibit correctional care from ever getting a medical contract, because they have Sparkles Wilson to screen against her because she is a woman, like I am. All right. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, appreciate you taking the time to come here. Anyone else? My name is Joan Hodewanitz. I live at 220 Linden Street in Scranton. Um, the last time I tried to come to a prison board meeting, uh, you were Excuse holding. Me, what, did someone deny you coming to a prison board meeting? No. Oh. I said the last time I tried to come, oh. you were the the board meeting was in the prison itself. We're required to have it there. Now I understand. Sorry. Right. Uh, but uh, I don't drive anymore, so I walked from downtown where I live and got there. And on the door was a sign, and basically it says no cell phones may be brought past this point so being a good little soldier i did an about face and went back home um i was later told that i could probably have left my cell phone at the front desk i'm not sure i, I do myself miss Hodewanis. okay right. uh but at any rate uh i bring this up for two reasons one um i wish you would change that sign so that people know you must, you know, surrender your cell phone at the front desk because this was at the door entrance. But you know that has nothing to do with the prison board. So I understand, but... security for the prison, and we are required to hold a meeting there. I understand, but as a member of the public who wanted to attend, I felt that I shouldn't go in, okay? All right. Uh, but the second thing was this morning at the county commissioner's meeting, they discussed the purchase of sleeves for cell phones. Okay, and uh, apparently uh, the idea is that in court situations like family court, uh, if a member of the public came in with a cell phone, they would deposit their cell phone into a sleeve. The sleeve would be locked. They would maintain the cell phone, and then when they left court, um, they would uh, unlock the, somebody would unlock the sleeve for them, they would return the sleeve and take their cell phone. This way they would not be using the cell phone within the court itself. Uh, have you considered doing something like that at the prison? Um, I, I can say that it's never been brought to my attention, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is a security issue. Um, cell phones in the courtrooms are a mm -hmm. big issue. Thank you. Uh, there was one high-profile trial uh, in the very recent past where uh, someone violated a court order. I think that was the Freen the trial. No, I believe it was the Cosby trial. Oh, the Cosby? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think someone else did it for and Freen. And broadcast closing arguments from yeah. there in violation of the court order. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a new technology, uh, relatively new, and uh, but... Uh, so everyone is trying to deal with that, Ms. Hodawan. It's in a way that respects the freedom of someone to communicate, mm -hmm. but also the obligation to maintain propriety, control, uh, security, and, and security being the big issue in the prison. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as I said, we are required to hold uh, meetings regularly at the prison, and we have to maintain the prison security. I mean, that is a, a high priority. I'm no, sure you I understand. That. I'm just saying that since there's this technology that the commissioners looked at for family court, uh, you might want to consider if it turns out to be um, a profitable and a um, successful program, maybe it could be expanded uh, into use of the prison. Because you. you do have things like prison board meetings there. 
Um, and the second thing is, I would have asked this question, uh, <laughs> except I didn't enter the prison at the time. Um, many people associate it with uh, the uh, Scranton Public Library. I'm happy to be on the board of the Friends of the Scranton Public Library. Um, have been trying to um, uh, advocate for the reestablishment of a library for the inmates in the prison itself. Uh, we have found ways to provide the books at no cost uh, to the government. We're looking at ways to provide personnel as volunteers to actually run the program. Uh, and um, we've been trying to do this now for several months, and I was just wondering if the warden is still here, if he could give us a status on where those initiatives stand. Thank you. We'll ask him before we adjourn. Then. Anyone else wish to address? Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Perry, uh, official member of the Pennsylvania Prison Society and official visitor. I'm also on the Lackawanna County Reentry Task Force. Um, I don't know if you gentlemen are aware, the Commissioner's Office, also the Lackawanna County Prison. The Reentry Task Force is putting on a Second Chance Festival on August 20th at Neog Park. We are currently looking for sponsors. This is for the purpose of reentry for inmates, uh, you know, getting out in, in, into society. The purpose of the Reentry Task Force um, is. The Second Chance Festival is to provide support for the returning citizens. Um, so we're kind of looking for some help um, for sponsors. Uh, I don't know if you, I'm sure you, some of you may be aware of this. Um, if the commissioner's office would like to participate in that, or Lackawanna County Prison, for that matter, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, here's another one if you want to pass that around. Thank you. Um, also, uh, I have inmates uh, that I visit um, a couple times a month who have asked me to address the sick call issue. Um, there's a policy with a sick call. It's a process and it's in particular for those inmates who have jobs. They put in a sick call and this is becoming a three-day process where it takes for them uh, to get you down just to see a nurse which in turn cost five dollars just to visit the nurse and then an additional $3 for their prescription. On top of that, they lose three days of pay, um, and they should be seen by a doctor from the moment of the first day that they put in their sick call complaint. That way they can get back to work as soon as possible. Um, from inmate workers, um, possibly are getting a free medical visit at the doctor, could see them. Paying for the prescription, I mean, if they're workers, right? They, they're being docked pay for, for that. And then they're forced to miss the three days of, of work. So um, maybe they should be compensated for at least just a doctor visit. In the work release center, if an inmate in the work release center, um, also, this is something different, I'm sorry, but these are requests I get from inmates. There's another inmate that made an assumption with regard to uh, an inmate having a dirty urine. So they're being charged to screen the person $35 out of their own pocket based on a hearsay. Do you know anything uh, about that in the work center? Does anyone know? Yes, everything, what, what you're referring to now are really fact specific cases. Uh, as one of the, the chief criminal judges here in the county, I get on a daily basis anywhere between five and ten letters from uh, okay I'd mm -hmm. suggest that you tell them uh, that if there is a specific complaint they address it to the sentencing judge first their probation officer then the sentencing judge we look into it if there's a problem we'll address it I'll defer that All right. thank, you. thank you also there are multiple lo uh, lawsuits lodged against Dr. Zaloga for malpractice and subpar treatment has the potential to cause the taxpayers uh, and the county hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why isn't the level of care being investigated and wouldn't it be most in appropriate to remove Zaloga pending disposition of these lawsuits? I think it would make sense uh, to not have him continue treating the inmates while posing such a risk to the inmates' health and the county and taxpayer. Um, other lawsuits could potentially arise from that. Um, the CBM, the food, um, I'm told that they get 
cash bonuses to keep the cost of the food down. The inmates are getting less than adequate nutrition. What is saved should go towards better food and not their alleged cash bonuses. I also have a complaint with regard to the low lights that are being left on uh, entering the jail and the intake department. They leave a low light beam on all night. But after you are classified and sent to the block, they leave low beams on every block. Uh, allegedly, this was uh, Captain Shanley's thing, who's no longer there, but the people that are working don't deserve to sleep with the light on. It's like... Uh, cruel and unusual. You can't sleep and then you have to get up and you have to work 24-7 uh, with the light on. I mean, I, I wouldn't particularly be fond of that and get any sleep if I were home. Um, okay, and one other issue, if you would, and I appreciate your time. Along with the kitchen workers, they're, they're forced to wear orange Crocs. I don't know if any of you have seen these Croc shoes, okay? I don't think they're safe to be uh, worn in the kitchen. Um, they don't have any shoes. Uh, some of the inmates don't have money to purchase shoes. So they're forced to wear these, these Crocs on maintenance crews and also in the kitchen. Um, so they're working in an area with food. For one, it's unsanitary to have open feet. And, a, and in the kitchen, it's a risk for dropping hot food on their feet, getting burns. Maybe they work in slippery areas because the floors are usually getting clean. And they're uh, well along with splashing grease on the floor, other food products on the floor that get dropped risk of falling. Um, there's cases of where they have penny loafers for, or like a slip-on uh, sneaker, per se, um, that you could just slip on. But why are some inmates being denied these shoes? And perhaps someone can delegate who gets these shoes if they're uh, an inmate em employee or not. Um, I mean, if you've seen those rubbery-looking shoes, you, you would agree that if they can't afford them, maybe they... Fish, can I just point out, I, I unfortunately had some recent experiences inside a hospital. Right. Uh, and did see uh, two surgeons wearing Crocs in the operating room. And so I, I don't know how unsanitary they would be, I mean, but uh, there is an issue of comfort uh, for some who so choose, but also I, I think what are being worn uh, in the form of uniforms uh, would be something that uh, I know the warden's been sitting in the back taking notes all the while you've been speaking. I'm sure he'll look into that as well. Well, as I, would I would appreciate I, that. I, I just I, I'm chuckling that if you're thinking that it's unsanitary, I'm going to have to tell these two surgeons about it. Well, what I'm reading are coming from inmates. It's not my personal opinion, okay. right? Gotcha. And I've seen these shoes myself personally, and that's just my personal opinion as well. No, Doctors may have a choice. That's what they prefer to wear during a six-hour operation. However, if you're an inmate and you're in the county prison and you're working in a kitchen for an eight-hour day, I mean, I could see where an injury can happen so as to maybe save the Lackawanna County Prison another lawsuit where somebody falls and has a broken ankle, per se. I'm just saying. Okay. Maybe the inmates can purchase a pair of sneakers if they weren't so much money. Uh, I have here state commissary and county commissary. County commissary, $74 for a pair of nylon Reebok sneakers. That's twice the price of a state. So maybe if these prices were reduced and Oasis, uh, say, wasn't the vendor anymore where everything is twice the price. Radios, $17.66 in the Department of Corrections. County, $31.75. Reading glasses in the Dollar Tree are $1. On the county commissary, they are $9.95. That, that's robbery to me. And maybe the inmate wouldn't have to wear Crocs, like I said, if they could afford sneakers at an affordable price with the commissary. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you okay. Anyone else? Hello, I'm Dr. Stephanie Bressler. I live in Scranton, and I'm representing Progressive Women of Northeastern Pennsylvania. We are now partnering with NEPA Prison Advocates, so I'm also representing them today. 
uh, I had uh, two questions for the warden uh, and some additional comments. Uh, the warden said last time that there would be some enhancement of pay for women based on upgraded jobs beginning July 1st, and I just want to confirm that. Please, that please yes. ma'am, if you would list what okay. you're asking, I'm going to ask the warden to come back and okay. address these things. As I said, he was keeping notes on what's going on, all right? Okay. All right. So I would just like to know if, in fact, that uh, change was implemented on July 1st. Uh, secondly, when the warden gave his report, uh, he talked about the commissary bids and said that we reviewed them and I wanted to know who are we? Is that Praces? Is it the warden and Praces? Are there other people reviewing those bids? I, I'm sorry, did he say bids or, or was talking about the uh, request for proposals no. that were being reviewed? Uh, I think he said that that they had three responses and he was reviewing we were reviewing those and asking for additional information we'll ask him. that's with the commissary okay I have some questions about medical services we've heard about medical services today and I have some questions about how they're assessed according to the Pennsylvania code 95.232.7 written local policy, and this would be for local jails and prisons, must provide for an annual documented review of a prison's health care delivery system by the prison and when necessary revision shall be made to each health care procedure and program by the prison. My first question is who does that annual review? Is it being done? Who does it? And how has that review contributed to improvement in health care services? Shall I continue? Please. Okay. Uh, the last RFP for medical services, and that was actually in 2009, uh, that last RFP required that the contractor provide a written plan of quality assurance procedures uh, program with the proposal. So the expectation was that anybody submitting, um, make, responding to that bid would also provide a written plan for quality assurance. Uh, so I'd like to know what does that plan look like? Uh, is it being followed? The contract that resulted from that 2009 RFP also references that medical care will be provided at the Eighth Amendment standard. So uh, I'd like to know, we would like to know uh, if there is in fact, if the response did in fact uh, include that quality assurance procedures program proposal and if it is being monitored by the prison and if the standard is being <coughs> reached. Uh, we certainly suggest that we go beyond the Eighth Amendment standard. Uh, we should be looking at a community standard of care, not just meeting that Eighth Amendment. So we are requesting that the current request for proposal requires a clear plan as to how the contractor will demonstrate, which is different than just saying, you know, this is what we're planning to do. We'd like to know how the contractor will actually demonstrate that health care services, including uh, if the subcontracted services, will meet the community standard of care. So we're hoping that the RFP will have that written into it and really require that the proposal show how the contractor is proposing to demonstrate meeting that standard. Um, shall I wait for the warden to respond to my questions? We're not going to, to him, I, excuse to me, we're, we will try to answer your questions. Okay. We appreciate the items that you're bringing to our attention and we'll do our very best to implement mm -hmm. them. But uh, the purpose of a board meeting and addressing the board is mm -hmm. not to engage in a debate.
but we will. We, we do appreciate the constructive <laughs> criticism, and, and we appreciate the input. As far as the medical standards go, uh, the standards that uh, the doctor is charged with employing are the same as any medical provider is to any medical consumer, and that is uh, what is medically acceptable at the highest and best level uh, that is appropriately affordable. And in seeking a contract here, uh, or looking at RFPs, or either hiring, rehiring, renewing, or getting new people in, uh, this board has been committed and remains committed to uh, far exceeding the Eighth Amendment standards, where we are not concerned with cruel and unusual punishment. We are concerned with uh, appropriate medical care, uh, with running a humane prison that is financially responsible and reasonable under the circumstances. We'd like to have the Mayo Clinic out at the county jail. We just can't afford it. Uh, so we try to hit the happy medium of uh, addressing all the medical needs in the best possible way. And I can assure you we will look as closely at that as we can, ma'am. Is that annual review uh, being the, performed? Uh, the review is done regularly. and. Uh, uh, in the form of lawsuits, I mean, what? Tell me what keeps the medical profession or any profession, the legal profession as well, uh, any more honest than knowing that you risk suit for malpractice if you do not maintain the services to the highest standards. Uh, so that is constantly there. Someone else referred to the fact that there are suits. Anyone can file a suit. Anyone who wants to swear out a suit can. Uh, but then that gets tested in court. Experts are called, and uh, as far as I know, I'm not aware of any recent judgments against our medical providers. People can file suits. The outcome is a far different thing. So, so there is an annual review that's done. There's, there's a constant review, man. We don't have a formal review process, but there's constant review going on. And once again, I can tell you in the form of letters and complaints, uh, the there eight other judges in the county. Uh, I know how many times Dr. Zaloga hears from me in a week's time. I get a complaint, I pick up the phone, I say, what's going on? All right, it's best we can do. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Is there a annual review done? There is, a, there is no a, annual formal. review process that okay. I am aware okay. of. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm just pointing to the Pennsylvania Code and the, the, yeah. All right, and we'll ask the warden, okay? okay. Warden, you want to just address these couple of things? Sure. Come on up. Yes, please. I'll, I'll address that last one first, okay. just to get it out of the way. Um, Doctors of Logan Correctional Care provide me with a monthly report. We don't do an annual because I get a monthly. Uh, the report isn't, I'm not a medical professional, I cannot interpret things from a medical perspective because I have no background in it whatsoever, but it, it kind of lets me and Deputy Warden Langan know what's going on. We'll know how many people have been seen, uh, they have things broken down into their various clinics. Um, I know that they utilize a, a triage format on the, the, someone had, maybe Joanne had mentioned, um, sick call and it taking some time obviously if my sick call slip says I'm having chest pains and it feels like an elephant is standing on my chest I'm gonna get seen before somebody else with a lesser um, symptom uh, so I know that they're triaging things and seeing things based on appropriateness medical appropriateness um, and you've many times called out to me when some special attention is required to approve me special medical attention at the hospital where we remove them immediately from the scene yeah, yeah. So we do try to stay on top of that. Again, I apologize, and well, I shouldn't apologize. I never went to uh, medical school. I had no desire to go to medical school. I really like what I do. So I'll, I'll continue being a corrections professional. I will, <laughs> I will interject in there. He's being reviewed by someone in the medical community, but I don't know who. Um, it depends on what, what he has set up for himself. So it's not as though he, I mean, he has to carry his license. So he can't keep a license without being reviewed. Um, if right. that's what she's referring to. If she's referring right. to the county, just our, our specific county, and you as the warden, if you're reviewing it, then you just answer right. the question. Right. Thank you. And, and thank you for that clarification because, again, I, I'm looking at it from a non medical professional standpoint on a monthly basis to make sure people are being seen in a timely fashion and are being addressed. How many are being seen for what? Um, my experience doesn't go much beyond that, though, uh, because of a lack of medical background. Um, did you want me to mention these other things? Else that you feel that was brought to the attention that you can address. 
Um, I wrote, I, I was oh, writing library. notes. The library, I, I was going to defer that to Deputy Warden Langan because he's been, um, he's been the one heading that up, but Dave, I'll, I'll take it. Um, oh. I know that Dave's been very active, has been working with Bev. I know that the Scranton Public Library has expressed interest, and I know that where we stand right now is that we're waiting to get um, volunteer sheets from the folks from the Scranton Public Library so that we can run them through and get them cleared for security purposes. Uh, we've done this in the past, Your Honor, and uh, a matter of fact, I'm, not to pat my own back, I, I coordinated it about seven years ago where I had uh, the bookmobile coming in and transferring out 300 titles every month. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's something that we are supportive of. Uh, we're certainly doing everything that we can do, um, but right now that's where we're at. We're just waiting for the paperwork to be able to clear the individuals for coming in. And we do have the book cards. Okay. Yes. There was a question raised regarding the uh, uh, pay adjustments for female. Uh, yeah, and, and they have been made. We gave the female block workers a couple extra duties. Effective July 1st, we bumped their uh, pay up to $5 a day. It was $3 a day like the male block workers. We came up with a couple extra duties to justify that extra amount of money to make things fair across the board. Uh, orange Crocs. Uh, orange Crocs are great. Uh, they they are they are slip uh, less slippery than sneakers. They are a requirement in the kitchen. They are not open toed. Um, we don't uh, we give those to the individuals who work in the kitchen. Um, they are orange because we don't want them walking out the door. Who wants orange Crocs? So they're they're fluorescent orange. Um, but yeah, that's 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 standard for us. That's kitchen wear because, as you know, the the Crocs are very water resistant, and and Joanne is 100% right. That floor is almost always wet because we're always having it washed down to keep things as clean as we can. Uh, but they're much better than sneakers as far as traction goes. When I when I go in there, I purposely drag my feet. I slide because otherwise I'm going to take a fall. And Crocs are Crocs are the best thing there. Um, I, I don't know. There, there were a lot of things. I, I don't know if I want to address everything or if there's anything any board member would like me to address, address at this point in time. I think there was a request made for an uh, executive session. Yes, there was. And, uh, at this point, we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Second it. Pardon me, are there more individuals who yes. wish to speak? All right. Well, would you address the inequity in prices and explain oh, the difference that the state has a, a system with 40 prisons and we have one and we get these things singly delivered to each prisoner? I think the prison board members should get the explanation on that. Uh, thank you. That is, one, that is one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wallace. Um, that He's 100 percent right. The uh, Department of Corrections has a main if you want to look at it as a main warehouse, they can order in a bigger bulk than a county prison can. When you order in a bigger bulk, you get cheaper prices. That doesn't explain the discrepancies that Joanne pointed out, uh, but it does explain some of the uh, some of the delay at this point in time um, regarding our commissary RFP. We've gone back to the mass for lower prices, just just so that you know we, we're trying to see if they can He's come a little we're, closer. We're reviewing them now too with the oasis that the committee is sitting down with. Yes, and, and Mr. Wallace is part of that meeting. Is it Dr. Bressler asking he's part of that committee, myself. Mr. De Mitchell. Kevin Mitchell, uh, Deputy Warden Langan, um, and Mr. Mr. Durkin. Yeah. And, and that's where we're at right now. We are, we've gotten initial proposals, and we're trying to get those prices down right now. And with the assistance of prices. All right, who are the other individuals who wish to address us? I'm sorry, I wasn't aware. Um, I'm Amy Fleming from Glenburn, and uh, I'm a clinical social worker and part of the Progressive Women's Group and Prison Advocacy. And uh, I, for a year, I was through EOTC. I went into the women's prison weekly and, and gave some programs, and I had a lot of concerns about the mental health issues. And I guess my question is, uh, I know my question is for the board, what are the plans for the mental health services in a medical service contract, since I know you'll be putting it out for bid? We have very few psychiatrists in this area. We have a real shortage. And it might be good to think about having some psychiatric nurses or psychiatric nurse or psychiatric social worker to follow up some of these people if the psychiatrists do not have the time for that. And I just ask that you consider that. 
Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Jean Harris. I'm also with the Progressive Women of Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, I'm concerned about the bidding processes in general. Um, so when uh, Dr. Bressler asked about the we in terms of who's reviewing the commissary uh, proposals, is there a written process that explains who reviews different proposals. So you've got the commissary RFP, you're putting together a food service RFP, a medical services RFP. Um, I'm also interested to know the list of services that are contracted out by the prison um, so that we can do some comparisons um, across other counties and what they get and the quality of their services. The bidding process is supposed to lead to the best product, the be best service for the best price. And if we don't do a good bidding process, that is not what happens. Um, and so the we in the commissary bidding, I don't know, you said names, I don't know who, what was done to create that committee, so the expertise on that committee. If indeed we are putting together, you are putting together a food service RFP and a medical services RFP, again, the folks who are involved in those processes are really important. So it would be helpful to know what processes are used to create those review committees to ensure that the there are no conflicts of interest, members who are reviewing as well as those who make the decision. So once the review is done, I'm also curious to know who makes the decisions about the contracts. Um, certainly when it comes to the medical services contract and all of these contracts, it would be helpful, it would be wise to make sure that anybody involved in making the decisions has no conflict of interest. So we would request that anyone who received campaign contributions from any of the bidding company's owners, family members of the owner or employees of the company on any RFPs that those folks who have that kind of potential conflict of interest not be allowed to be on the review team or the decision team to assure that the best services are gained for the best price. The process also should be open. So are the bids for these RFPs technically, are they officially opened in a public forum? Um, is there anybody on the review team for these different RFPs that are being developed um, that is independent of the prison board? Again, worried about uh, different conflicts of interest. I also would like to uh, know where I can get information on the legal regulations of the use for canteen funds um, and the legal restrictions on profits that can be made. Wondering if given the fact that you're saying the state can charge so much less for items because they are buying so much more, if the county would consider looking into collaborating and purchases with other county prisons, maybe to save money, get some economies of scale. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the questions that I wrote down here. I, I think that covers all of my questions. I am concerned that um, while the RFP for the medical uh, contract said that there would be annual reviews, it sounds like we don't have medical professionals connected to the county doing those reviews. The solution should not be that people have to sue. And inmates don't have the same abilities to move quickly through a lawsuit if indeed they feel that they are being denied community standard of care um, in addition to the Eighth Amendment. And we shouldn't stoop to the Eighth Amendment. And so I'm a bit concerned that there is possibly monthly reviews looking at numbers, but that doesn't look at quality of care issues. And the RFP for the medical contract should clearly have some kind of written process by which the quality of care is being looked at, not just numbers. Thank, thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you. Okay, we'll take it under consideration. Anyone else? At this point, then, we'll go into executive session as approved and uh, ask everyone other than the board members, the solicitor, and the warden to remain. Everyone else leave, please. Can't stay.